Tri-Cities Community Television presents the third speaker series, Life Stories, put on by the Coquitlam Public Library. Um, hello and welcome to the Coquitlam Public Library. We acknowledge that Coquitlam Public Library provides service on the unceded and traditional territory of the Coquitlam First Nation, which lies within the shared territories of the Suela Tooth, Kaysi, Musqueam, Kakite, Squamish, and Stolo Nations. So welcome to our third session in our five-part speaker series, Life Stories. We wanted to present real life stories of people from marginalized groups and how they experience prejudice, social exclusion, or stigma. By understanding and appreciating everyone's past and present, we can build a better future for all. We want to thank you for attending this session. Please join us for the remaining two parts every Tuesday evening until November 22nd. Today's session is women and children affected by the justice system and how people in the justice system are impacted by mental health, addiction, and homelessness. So because this is a life story, I'm going to give you a tiny little bit of my life story. So about 15 years ago, I joined the board of Elizabeth Fry. Until that point, I had never thought about how being in prison affects women and their children. At the time, I was told that two-thirds of children with a parent in prison end up in prison themselves. So I had a two and a half year old and a one year old. And to me, that was so impactful. I just couldn't get past that idea. But it's now half because of organizations like Elizabeth Fry. And that fact, along with meeting two of the directors of Elizabeth Fry, is what motivated me to sit on the board. Those seven years on the board changed me fundamentally. They changed the trajectory of my career from an accountant and a project manager to someone who works in nonprofit focuses on community development. Um, a few times when I've been interviewed for positions, they say, how did you go from being an accountant to wanting to work in community? And I tell them the story of sitting in a fry um, and meeting some of their clients and how one woman said, to, told me her story and I was gobsmacked. And I thought, look how resilient this woman is and we need to do better. So when we start talking about running a series like this, I knew we had to go to EFI because if they could impact me that much, imagine what could happen if more people heard their stories. So we're going to welcome Kirsty Gordon, and um, I will let you introduce. I will let her introduce herself, and we will have time at the end for questions. Hello everyone. So um, I'm I'm going to really discuss the the programs that I run for EFRI. Um, my my um, experience. I, I was working in the prison system in the UK for ten years before I came back to Canada with uh, an idea that I wanted to change careers and that I I had been in the in that. You know, surroundings for, for 10 years of my life, and it, it does impact you as a worker in, in those places because you are actually witnessing firsthand the marginalization of women, the marginalization of men. I've worked both in men and women's institutions. Um, but I came back to Canada, and you seem to um, return to what you know. And so I was introduced to E. Fry. Uh, we did have Elizabeth Fry in the UK, but they they, they, they dealt mainly really with housing. Um, here in Canada and here in Vancouver, it's the biggest Elizabeth Fry Society um, of or, or throughout Canada, but it's affiliated in, in name and what we do for women and children. Um, only we're not really joined, but but we are, you know, affiliated by our name. Does anyone know who Elizabeth Fry was? She was a woman, in the, a real life woman, um, in the 1700s. She was born in 1780, and she was a Quaker. And um, she, the 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 way she got involved with um, women in prison was seeing. The, the terrible um, 
ways they were treated um, with their children. They were incarcerated with their children back in the, in the 1800s, in the early 1800s. Um, and she wanted to make a change to, to that then, and then started her crusade. And um, she got together all the, the women. She was quite a society woman. Um, and got together um, all the all the women that were, um, you know, married to the the the, the men in in, um, in her, her um, I'm sorry in her her standing and and they started cooking for the women. They started um, providing you know blankets and clothing for the children. And that is how she started to be known for what she did. She went on to have 11 children herself, as well as um, continuing her, you know, crusade to to help help the women that are incarcerated. Which is what we do with the Fry. That is our prime focus: is um, women in incarceration, the children of incarcerated women and and men and um, women that um, are homeless and, and have addiction issues. So um, what I do for EFRI is I run all the children's programs. Um, I've been working for them for 10 years now. Um, I started with a, um, an idea that I did want to change up what I was doing, I, I didn't want to go straight back into the prisons again. I wanted to work with the, the families that, you know, in a preventative way rather than, um, you know, what, what they were ending up at. So I thought, what better place to start than with Elizabeth Fry Society? Because we take um, pride in the fact that. We are gender specific to women. Um, we develop programming, and, and we were the first to develop programming for the children of incarcerated parents. Um, they are a forgotten um, group that are, there, there aren't the, the supports needed um, by these children. You know, we're starting to know about that now. We're, we're, we're starting to know how much, um, well, you, you've all heard of, you know, four to six were the detrimental years. So the detrimental years are zero to three now. So whatever happens in those first three years of life are going to affect you for the rest of your life. And so what my, um, my ED, who you know very well now, um, Sean Bates, she's a crusader. And she's an amazing, amazing woman. And she was going to come and talk to, to you today, but unfortunately she couldn't. Um, she would have sent a number of us for training in a program called Growing Great Kids. Um, it's based out of um, the States, I think Cincinnati. They, um, they came and they trained us. It's very expensive training. We had six, a, a team of six. Women, six, um, six of my colleagues and I um, trained, and it was. It, it's a. I've, I've got the the books here to show you, but it's all attachment based training. So, how can you be a good mom if you haven't had it yourself? How can you possibly know how to parent if unless you've had that solid start, right? And so with these books, they're a curriculum-based program, and they go from from um, 0 to 6 months, 6 to 12, 12 to 18, up to 3 years old. And um, they're a, a very easy program to follow. Um, there's often literacy issues with the client base that I work with. so. They're, they're fun, they're colorful, and they're explaining the ways that we build our children's bodies, the way we build their minds, the way we build their, um, their resilience. 
to what life has to offer. So we were trained in this program in 2016, um, and we started facilitating the program. We've had two studies, that one is going at the moment that is um, seeing how the impacts of how this program affects the parenting skills of our, of our um, clients. And I have been teaching this program since 2018 in um, Fraser Valley Institution, um, working with moms and babies that um, have had their babies and have them with them in the prison. Um, there's also a family strengthening portion, so I did a family strengthening program there. And um, we are talking about uh, a program sort of uh, modifying some of the workbooks to enable um, the, the parents. It's very hard for, for um, women and, and men to build connection with their kids when they're incarcerated so far away. When you're in a federal institution, you're often taken from your province. Most of them are taken from the province of the women that I work with. So their children are, are based, you know, in Saskatchewan, back east, um, and they're incarcerated here. So how does that connection build? So it's about uh, the, the, the program that I think we really have to concentrate on is um, the reintegration into building that, that communication again, because it can um, and does separate because they don't get the visits with their kids. Visiting is so very important. And um, the ones that, are, uh, that, that have their children in the lower mainland, that's OK. But you know, we've tried video visitation. It's, it, it works sometimes, but a lot of times if they, they live in remote areas where they don't have access to the, um, to the means to, to have a video visit. Um, the prison does try, you know, they are seeing the effects that the family connection has on their clients and, um, and we're trying to, to build that awareness every single day. Um, so stories, well, I will, um, I'll tell you a story of one of my clients that I worked with for I guess two months before she um, had the baby in, in prison, and this was last year, she started the program with me. There's a prenatal section of, of this program, and it's all about building that connection, building that, um, getting in sync with your unborn child, you know, building those, those connections before the child's even born, um, working on your, your um, your, uh, your nutrition, working on your, uh, you know, developing your own health to then sustain the health of that baby. Anyway, so uh, me and I, I'm going to call her Sarah, I to call her Sarah, but um, we started working together and then two months after we started, um, her baby was born. It's a baby boy, beautiful beautiful boy. She had um, a partner outside that was not a healthy influence on her. So a lot of our meetings, I would meet with her every week um, for a couple of hours a week. And then we'd also do the family strengthening program after. So she actually got about three hours of intense, you know, family work um, every week. And um, she just went from strength to strength. She ended up coming out um, with her son into our um, housing. We have a house um, called Columbia Place where women that are transitioning out of prison, they come and live with us for their, until they're wet, their, their parole's on. Um, so that can be anywhere from you know a couple of months to it can, it, it can go up to um, 18 to two years with us. Um, 
Anyway, Sarah came out uh, with her son. We continued the program on the outside. We talked about the ways that, um, you know, she had been parented herself, and part, you know, most of her her issues were because of the sort of chaotic upbringing she had herself, and we're not. Um, in this program, we're not there to say, you're doing it wrong. We're just asking them to think, if you did this another way, what do you think the outcome would be? How would you feel? It's, it's empathetic parenting. It's teaching empathy. It's teaching them to think from the child's point of view, how they felt when they were growing up. And, you know, they have the, the chaotic, Household, they had a parent in addiction, or they had a parent that was, you know, fighting with the other parent all the time. And those, those are remembered. Those, those things are remembered. I remember it from my own childhood. Um, and what it does is it, it builds that awareness, and it, and because it's not um, taught in a way that is sort of saying you're a crappy mummy because you're definitely not a crappy mummy. You just have to learn the skills to be able to parent properly. And and properly meaning you're building your child from the bottom up, right? And that's what we are as parents. Um, so long story short, she, she then went um, to, and she could, she started building a relationship with her own mother. When she um, had the baby, she we had talked about she had had been estranged from her for seven years, um, and she we we talked about that relationship and how she would love her mom to be involved in her life again. So we started that, and we started writing, you know, drafts of letters so that she could say to her mom, this is, this is how I, you know, this is, her, her mom was estranged from her because she didn't like her lifestyle, but her mom was a part of, of her having that lifestyle because of, you know, the way she parented, right? And so it was, a, it, it's not just what happens with the clients that we work with, it's the surrounding, it's the family, it's the family as, as, the, as a whole. And it has to be a holistic view of, of that little baby and the ripple effects that are, are coming out from that child. You know, there's, there's generations there that, that, that have to learn and, and, and want to be a part of that child. And, and um, involved in, in the upbringing of that, that, mean, that mean little person. Anyways, she ended up going and going back to her hometown and living with her mom. And she, we, we still did the program once every two weeks by, the, by Zoom. And they are, they've got this amazing relationship now. And everybody is happy and she has no um, no thought of, of going back to her past because this child has changed her future right and and that's what we want right the the statistic that you said at the beginning two out of three it's actually one out of two now so I mean it's bigger it's not smaller, it's bigger, right? It's, it, it's more kids are going into the way that, that um, they're, they're following their, their parents' footsteps. So we are really trying to change that trajectory. So that's one little aspect of what I do. Another um, thing that um, is focused on the children of incarcerated parents, and, and this year we had um, this year and last year and the year before when COVID hit, um, you all heard about what was happening in um, the domestic violence situation. Um, many, many, many women and children were affected. Um, 
because you were living and having to stay indoors with a partner that was abusive and you know there was no getting away from it. So um, we, with BC Housing, set up um, shelters in two hotels, three hotels at first in 2020, and um, and then it went down to two hotels in Surrey, where we had 60 beds in each um, hotel that were full. They were full with with women and kids, and those children um, are the ones that we. Um, concentrated our camps on this year um, and last year we had we run a summer camp program it's usually an overnight camp um, sometimes these children you know a lot of them are growing up doing foster care and it's the only time that they can actually get together as a family to to you know, we, we were running overnight camps and they would you know stay together for a week and um, it was a really special place. Now we're running day counts because of COVID, um, but it's still a special place and it's a week long. Um, it, it's $40 and it, it costs the family $40 to send their kids to count for a week, right? Which is pretty reasonable. Um, and you know, we did things like um, go to the aquarium, we went up to Grouse Mountain, we went to beach days. Um, you know, in the um, like down at down at Spanish banks, we went did barbecues. They had a really great time. Um, so that's another thing that we run, and the, that was primarily for the children that were in our shelters for the last two and a half, three years. Um, and now we have just opened another building. This, I'm, I'm going to let you all out. I'll take one of these. Home. Right? But um, this is our, our um, annual report this year, and this is a new building we've just built in Surrey that has uh, 48 um, single dwell dwelling units in it. Well, no, it has 30 single dwelling and then the rest are family units. Um, it has a medical center downstairs. Um, it has childcare. It's pretty exciting and. Our growing great kids. We're going. To, it's going to be a growing great kids hub. So we're going to have families in and um, do group work and one-on-one -on -one work with them. So um, and then so that's the account. And I was going to tell you about the um, the reading program. We do a, a, an amazing reading program in the prison. So it's in um, the, the net institutions as well as in those institutions. We take brand new storybooks in, we record the, the parent reading or the grandparent or the uncle or aunt and they, we record them reading a story that they pick out for their child, the child in their life and um, then we send the recording and the book to the child at home so you can hear his mom or dad reading the, the town story. And it's a beautiful, beautiful um, program because it, it, it builds that connection. We find when fathers go into prison, it's a time for dads to build connection with children that some of, sometimes they don't even know their, their kids that they've had, you know, some of them, right? And we have found that fathers by reading to their children, have developed this um, this relationship. I'll tell you a story that was pretty exciting. So this one fellow, he was um, incarcerated in um, Prince George, and his um, his child. So we do we did run the the, the um, program up in Prince George as well, like the satellite program. It stopped now because of COVID, but everything stopped because of COVID, unfortunately, in the prisons. But um, ours are going again. Anyways, he um, had his he he had his his girlfriend was pregnant, and you know he he was incarcerated for the whole time she was pregnant, but he would send these storybooks home to her with the recording. 
And so she was reading the book, but his voice was reading the, the story. And she used to play it for her baby in her tummy. And when he came out of prison, the child knew his voice. When the, the child was born, he came out of prison, the child was like four months old. And when the dad was reunited, he said, he knew me, he knew me. I felt that he knew my, my voice. So that was a very special story, and it made us all cry when we, when we heard it. Um, and many times, um, inmates have, have called us and said that they want to contribute their money that they're earning inside the prison to the storybook program so we can go out and buy more books. So that's how special it is to lose eyes and health. Um, so I think what I'll do now is sort of open it up to you guys and ask questions. I can speak, but I'm not. Oh, sorry, Woolworths. Yes, OK, <laughs> finally, Woolworths. I'll tell you about. So I brought some products here. So Woolworths is, is um, the last thing I'm involved with. <laughs> um, so what we do is um, we have a little house in New Westminster. And um, we, the, the women that are living in our um, transitional housing, they come out of prison and they have a job when they, um, when they come out with us. We were, before COVID, running part of this program in the prison, so they were learning how to, we, we, how, how it works is we get donated wool from, from farmers around BC, and um, the women learn to wash, card, uh, sort it, wash it, card it, and make these beautiful products from it. So these are hand-felted dryer balls that, that the women make. Um, we, there's no waste at all in our um, in our business. It's a social enterprise, so in, anything we make goes straight back into the business. As Sean keeps telling me, you're not making money. And I, I know I'm not making money, but we're supporting the business. It just goes straight back in. So this is um, the product from the sorting. So when a, when you get a, a fleece off a sheet. It's quite a dirty mess, right? So they have to skirt the outside of the uh, outside of the wool, and that initial sort comes out. We put it in. We've got two of these machines that actually grind that wool and manure up and pelletize it, and so that it makes these these easy to handle pellets that don't really smell like sheep. Because I can tell you, our house smells like sheep. <laughs> and uh, but these are great because um, what they do, you mix them into your pots, for, in your summer pots or your spring pots for tulips, and they retain water. They they hold like four four and a half times their weight in water. They um, they slugs can't travel over wool because it's barbed, and they can't glide over the wool. So stop slugs um, and it's a slow release nitrate rich fertilizer and again we're in studies with UBC the whole UBC they're doing they're doing because we want it to be evidence-based right everything that we do at EFRI is evidence-based and that you know mostly concerning you know what we're doing for marginalized women and, and how we need to to step up and, and change our society, or it's not going to get any better, you know. Um, but with with Woolworths, it's it's a, an amazing. Um, the team of women I work with are are the most amazingly resilient women. My um, coordinator, she's she hasn't been in prison, but she was she was a. a involved in addiction for years and years. She lost her children, she lost her home, her partner died. She's now got her life back. She's got her kids back. She's got a job that she earns a living wage at. She's got a 
a, a beautiful home, and she's she's just a star. And I've got a card here that you can do the QR code and watch a little video. I was I thought I could bring the video, but it's I always have problems with the computer. So, but you can all watch it on your phones. QR code. Anyway, so that's so that's Woolworks, and um, and we developed this enterprise to. Um, when, when you come out of prison, it's really hard to get a job. You've got a record, and you know it's hard to get employment. But you know what came first, chicken or the egg? You've got to start somewhere. You've got to be able, if you, if you want to have a fulfilling life, you have to feel fulfilled, right? And and this is what this program does for the women. And um, these I'll just show you the kiss the roses stones. For Christmas, and we sell many, many. I'm starting to look English. There's a little pop. I'm so cute. So you can come around and look at this after. And um, so that's me, I think, but I'd like to open it up for questions because I'm better at answering questions than actually than tables. Anybody have any questions? Uh, you said that you were mentioned once working with foster groups, but presumably fostering has to be a huge part of if there's kids. I mean, how does that work with kind of if a baby is born in an institution, wouldn't it go into foster care and they're working with foster groups? Not, not necessarily. So there's a mother and child program in the federal institutions. Not all of them, but many of them. And there's actually a really great purpose-built building in the provincial institution in Lake Bridge here. Um, the women have to apply. There's a lot of hoops to jump through, but you know they have to um, meet the criteria to be able to raise their child in prison. And it's a controversial thing, isn't it? You know, I mean, what what do you feel when you hear that? What what is the general consensus? And it's you know, no judgment because most people feel that, you know, my friends are like, you know, a child shouldn't be in prison, a child shouldn't be, but that, that child needs to be with its, its mother. It has no idea where it is, you know, that baby has no idea what it's growing up in and, you know, it's for a period of time um, and they are able to go on outings outside so they can go they go to the doctor outside they can go to play groups outside they can have birthday parties with their children outside so the the prison does accommodate for children but the the women that that are involved in that program they have to um, meet this criteria and sometimes i mean like the one in Maple Ridge, I shouldn't even say this, but the MCFD will not allow babies in that prison. Like they're, they're the ones that are preventing the mom and baby unit being used in that prison. And, it, and it's really sad because, because I work with them full, you know, that, that's my, I, I see what, what it does to have, have a child in prison. Those those children, for I would say, in the in in the four years or five years that I've been working with moms and babies in there, the ones that have had their babies in there, and they've had other kids before that on the outside that they don't have that, a relationship with, or the child's been brought up in the care of their grandparent or their or their mother or an aunt or a sister or whatever. Um, they, though, those ones that have the child in with them, they go on to parent that child successfully. There's only one that hasn't, that, that I've worked with, out of seven, right? So that's six out of seven, that's a pretty high ratio, you know, for me to see anyways, you know. I'm not saying, you know, it's the program. I'm not saying it's that, but it's just having that support. I mean, it's also um, support around 
and when you're in prison, there, you're, 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 you're fed, you're clothed, you're, you don't have the stresses of that 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 can be societal. You know, when you're in addiction, you don't have that that sort of addiction piece. So it can be a positive thing. Child, kill me if you hear me say that. But I've seen that there are positive things that that that, that can do for uh, a um, you know a mother and baby until she gets on her feet, until she can feel that that um, she can do it. And and the thing about this program is that we don't just end it there. We're you know, I'm still in contact with the moms that I worked with in, in 2016, you know, and still seeing their their day-to-day -day wins that, that happen. And those kids are now seven, you know. So, so yeah, it's, I mean, there's the, the foster care system, it's, it's huge here. There's so many children in foster care. And, um, you know, we're, we're just trying our best to, to, to support those children, um, build their memories, let them be children, because that, you know, many of them grow up not being kids, they become the parent. If a parent's in addiction, or a parent's, um, you know, in chaotic lifestyle, the, the, the child often becomes the, the parent in that situation. So with our camps that we offer, and we did offer so, um, Saturday Club again pre-COVID, but we should be getting that started again soon, um, where the kids would come, you know, a group of kids, they grew up with me for, for eight years. You know, they were with me every Saturday. You know, and it was, it's a really special thing. And, you know, I meet them now and have coffee with them. One of my counselors this summer was actually one of my kids back in, you know, he, he went to our camps for four years and he's now a father himself and he came back to work for us and it was really special. You know? And just, come <laughs> on. But yeah, so, but it is, I, I'm, I, it's from the horse's mouth. It, it's much better for a baby to grow up with its mother, whether it be she's incarcerated or not. It's much better for that baby to have those those detrimental years with the mother and form that bond. Anything else? Chris, can you talk about the different houses that um, you have? Sure. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. So, um, as I said, that one is called Rosewood, and that is um, just right by Surrey Memorial Hospital. Um, we also have um, Transitions to New Beginnings, with, which is a, a house for mothers with babies that are transitioning out of addiction or out of incarceration, so they can go there with their and children and we, we do the program there with them. Um, we have um, Allendale program which is an addiction program in um, Surrey and in the basement of that program we have Allendale Cradle for women that are in full-on addiction that they can live there with their babies and we support their, um, their parenting in, in that program. We have Firth, which is out in Abbotsford, um, which is a, we, we have beds that are CSC beds so that the women that are coming out of, out of the prison are, are housed there until they um, are into our transitional housing. We have um, an addiction program there. We have a homeless shelter there that I think has 68 Beds. We're just opening another, um, uh, you know, modular housing. It's actually they just put. Did you see the video? They put this last module on two days ago. So they build it in modules. They're all little apartments that are stacked on top of each other. 
So that is all housing for women and for women and children. Sorry, guys, it's harder than that. But, you know, they, they, there are, we, we do support men in other ways. So, but but it, that's where we're really um, specific. So, you know, there's, we, we see the need and we fill it. And I don't know how they do the fundraising and how they get the money, but somehow Sean and now Vera, do you know about Vera? So we have a COO now, which has taken the pressure off Sean because Sean is trying to run not only, you know, proposals and getting funding, but she was also trying to run everything else. And now. We've got a sort of divided leadership, which is which is a lot better. It takes the pressure off each other, and they can both concentrate on their their bits. But we do. That, Vera's really good at that too. She was in. Um, she she did uh, a lot of work with the um, Surrey Board of Trade. But yeah, so it's it's a pretty we're we're a huge organization now, um, huge because the need is there, and, and we're there to, to fill that need. And you know, I feel privileged, and I my job is is not a job to me because it's diverse. I work with wonderful people my clients, as well as the women that I work with um, in Woolworths, as well as, you know, the, the staff in, in E-Fry. We, um, we're a family, you know, and that's how we um, conquer the issues that we're facing. We're about empowering women. We don't enable, we empower them to make those life changes that they need to make themselves because they can see it. We can see it. We're women. We're powerful. They can do it with the right support. So. Where can we buy the Woolworths products? Well, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I've got a square thing on my phone right now, but we do have this house that is open um, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Um, it's just across from Royal Columbian Hospital. You've seen our big blue building, so that is a, that's a, I didn't talk about that building, so that building has a, a shelter for women and children, it has the transitional housing for women coming out of prison, it has, um, the third floor is a, um, it says second stage housing for women that are, you know, just need that, that support to, to live on their own again before going out into the world and then down in the bottom area um, we have all our admin and we have housing programs that work, the workers that work with women to find housing for, for women so that's a big blue building in, in new west you've probably seen it when you drive by salary yeah that's it yeah it's like blue is uh, shoplifters anonymous still operating out of that building yes yes it is yeah no the so so with um we that used to be our head office there but we we actually moved down we got too big you know we had that little we have a little tiny room that was a boardroom that everybody's trying to squish into but now we've got quite a spacious area in um, Royal and Six. So in the West, that's where our head office is. That's the hub of everything. And, um, but yeah, if you if you want to come to Woolworths, you, you're welcome to, to drop in 10 to 3, Tuesday, Wednesdays, Thursdays. And we also have an Etsy site. We also have a website called Woolworths. So it's W-O-O-L. <coughs> W-E-R-X, not my choice for name, but there you go. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but yeah, come on down, the girls love to talk. We've actually been running um, craft fairs uh, every second weekend at um, New West Farmers Market this year. So 
that was really successful. And, um, and we're doing some Christmas markets too. So yeah, come and see us. But you know, if you'd like to have a look today, that's fine. We've got we've got hand spun wool as well, and weavings. They need weavings. Um, but we've got a whole house full of, um, of fleece, like probably. We, we, this woman was a, this woman contacted me in April and said um, there, there's a, a lady who's dealing with her daughter's hoarding of fleas. And this woman, we went, I went to her place. It was in Victoria, and a house, two outbuildings, two cars in the driveway were full of fleas. So we got yeah from all over the world, not even open like boxes of fleece, and this was the woman's home, and her daughter was the hoarder. And I felt really bad, because I know, you know, I've, I've worked with hoarders before, and but she just said, it's out of here, it's got to go. And she was at work one day, and we got a van, and we just built this van for So those, that's what we got upstairs, and it's this fleece. That's all the ones that we uh, get from the farmers. And we process well for farmers that because it's really expensive to, to get it done. That's why it's a dying art, you know, wool pr producing wool because it's so expensive to, to process it. But we're reasonable and um, and we do it's all hand done. We've got these hand carters and we've got beautiful spinning wheels from New Zealand. So it's a beautiful wool. Is any knitters here from the house? Come and see our wall. It's really, it's, it's incredible. It really is. Christy, can I ask um, sure. the demographics of the women that you serve? The demographics? Yeah. Like yeah. I remember that in the indigenous. I would say 65% are indigenous. Yeah. Can we just look at this? Yeah. Look. <laughs> well, um, because it changes every year, but um, I mean, Indigenous women are so overrepresented in the prison system, I can't tell you. I would, you know, they say 60, but I would say it's more like 75 myself. And they represent 3% of the population. Exactly, exactly. And how wrong is that, right? So it is, uh, I will find that out for you, okay? Um, it, it just, I don't want to give you wrong Okay, so here's our clients, right? We serve 10,242 clients, of which 1,567 children. Um, we had, uh, we, we've served five times more homeless children in the past three years, and 59% more children than last year. So this is, this is the reality, like, this year, you, you know the housing crisis that we, we have, and, and you know children are the ones that are bearing the brunt. It's, it's terrible. Um, we oh the uh, we do have another house I forgot about. I just saw the flood evacuations. We have to actually airlift um, clients and staff out of our house. We have a house out in Chilliwack, um, way out between like almost in um, uh, Harrison, that, that side of Chilliwack. It's a moot. It's a moot, yeah, but it's not a moot anymore. A moot's moved into town. A moot is a program that we run, there's another one, that we run for, for Indigenous girls that are um, serving the last five and a half months of their sentence. And so they, it's, it's has totally um, geared towards Indigenous women and young women and um, they they um, do healing that we have the elders come um, it's a beautiful program. I worked in that when it was out in Chilliwack years ago. Um, but now no that's a that's another um, addiction program out there. But they the the floods came, you know, the floods last year and they had to be airlifted out by helicopters. It was quite it's quite a feat. I mean, it was exciting, but not in a good way, you know. 
Yeah, so um, I haven't even had a chance to look at this, so I'm going to let you look at that, but I will, I, I will, the, the, yes. I, I think that my point was the, the significant over-representation of Indigenous significant in, in the, the prison system. Yeah, and, ch and the children in my programs, yeah. like the, the children, um, the, the Indigenous homeless children this year and last year are, were, more than ever, and we, we count that, we do count that, so, um, yeah, it was, I would say, um, I would say probably, because uh, there are self-identify, you know, they, they self-identify, and so it, I would say that there was 70 to 75 percent Indigenous children in my programs in, in the summer and we have three indigenous staff, so out of, out of five, so that's pretty good, yeah. So we do, you know, we, we it, it's important to respect and um, deliver in a respectful manner our programming, and that means our staffing has to reflect our client base, right, our client And, you know, for the most part it does. I know I'm a white, you know, <laughs> female, but I, I've, I've always, um, it was, it's really strange. I was in England for 25 years, and I had no idea until I came back what had happened here. You know, I wasn't taught it at school. I wasn't taught anything. I learned when I was, like, 10 years ago. And how sad is that? Yeah. But, but anyways, that, oh, yeah. Um, I'm, just, I'm, I'm curious about this wool business. Like, how, it, it's really kind of an interesting enterprise. Like how did that? it start? Yes, yeah. Well, okay, so we had another business, and I guess it was when you were there, it was called Asphalt Gals. And Asphalt Gals was, um, it was a roofing, so when you got the tiles off roof, roofers got the tiles down, and they, they're often, they're stuck, those, those asphalt tiles were stuck on the roof, and it was a really labor-intensive job for um, the, the roofers to, because everything's recycled now, and they had to peel it off the wood and, and dispose of it, you know, in, in, in you know, whatever they did. I wasn't involved in that. But um, we found that that program, it was hard graft, right? That, and, and women that are, that are coming out of addiction or have, coming out of prison where they haven't been, you know, used to that physical labor. No, it, it's not, it, it, it wasn't um, sustainable, you know. It wasn't that, that we were constantly trying to find the workers or the workers were calling sick because they injured themselves. It was too, it was too much work. So, I was a florist years ago and I said to Sean that I think we should, because we talked about it, we talked about what we should open, right? What we should think about doing. And I thought a florist, right? Opening a, a, a floristry because it's a huge markup on the stems, like 300% markup before you even put them in a bouquet, right? And, um, and yeah, she didn't go for <laughs> She's crafty. She, she was a knitter and a crocheter and she um, we, we got this woman in to, to we needed to, to know that we were going down the right path. Um, and, and this woman, Diana Twist, she's, she's quite famous in the woolly world. And uh, she came and consulted with us and set up the program. And that's how we ended up. It was Sean's idea. <laughs> but it was a great idea because it's, it, it, the thing is, when I was working in the UK in the prison, um, I ran a jewelry enterprise in there, and so the women would would make um, 
you know, uh, Indian beading jewelry. They'd make uh, beautiful stuff. And we were actually just selling it, starting to sell out to stores outside there. But I knew from that social enterprise how a repetitive um, action, it, it's calming, it, it allows you to either immerse yourself in your own, you know, being, or sit and chat to other women. And it, it, it's, it was the same with this, right? It's a repetitive task that, you know, they're, 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 but they're all different jobs. There's, there's a huge area of jobs in that place now. You know, we, Summer organizes them all. There has to be sorts done every day so that the sorting's done. That sort's put into the freezer for a couple of days to, to get moisture in it and then that's taken out and Marnie then lays it out, dries it, then she starts feeding the machine and that pumps those pellets out. Whereas the wash wool is, is then carded. Carded means that it's combed so that all the, the hairs are facing in the direction. So it's, 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 it's a repetitive thing, but it's, it's artistic. And it's also um, like involving the, the, um, the craft fairs and things that we do. It, it, sh it, it teaches how to run a business. Right. They learn all aspects of it. Yeah, it sounds brilliant. Yeah, it's really, it's a really great. And, um, and we did get these fancy boxes done last year because we were going into stones. But, um, and we still probably will, but they're very, it's really hard to get them into, um, into programs. But my neighbor, it works, she's quite high up in Sage, and so I'm trying to get her to do, do I think it would be brilliant partnership. It's like that, you know, the, all those smelly whales and things. I don't really know. Oh, oh, no, Whole Foods. What's that? Whole Foods. Whole Foods. I know Whole Foods would be brilliant, but it's almost like three years apparently to get here into Whole Foods. But you know, I, I spoke to, I mean, in talks with this guy with these pellets. I'm taking him actually a load tomorrow. Um, and he's well connected with Garden Works. It's a huge job. Yeah, and I tried to get into Garden Works, but it's, just, it's hard to sell. You know, it's a real hard sell. You have to be on it. And I'm so busy with my other programs that I can't, you know, fully, but I'm really going to concentrate on that in the new year because it's, um, but Whole Foods would be excellent. I mean, they, I did try choices. And choices, I yeah, I gave them a whole whack of dryer balls to try, and, and then you know it's back and forth, back and forth, and they wanted us to go down, down, down. You can't go down. You know, you can only go down so much. Come on, we're not making it. For There's sure. a, a really great independent um, store in Cologne called Artisan Gifts. Oh. And they're in Austin and like Marmont area across from the brand new. There's a big safeway across the street, and they only, almost only have local artists really? and information. Like, and they sell all kinds of things. That would be brilliant. They could be a good yeah. customer. Artists and artists. Artists and Okay. I'll look at that. Definitely. They are. I just have to. I just have to say this week I'm not doing anything else but selling. I can't sell, but it's just I have to be on it because it's all the follow up. But I'm the only one that drives in the whole program, not the girls drive. So it's really like picking up and dropping off to the markets. And you know that rain and cold on Thursday night? Everybody, two were sick. I did it myself. And I, oh my gosh, I've never been so cold in all my life. All my life. But so what's the age range of the girls maybe that work at this? At Woolworths? I would say they start in the about mid-twenties and um, the oldest is she's older than I am and um, you know she was incarcerated for a long time yeah 
and, and um, they, it's, it's, it's a current purpose and empowerment and they'll tell them they'll tell you themselves like what Efri's done for them you know like like summer and she's my name she will come to the shows and she's not like I can talk to you freely about her because she's given me that permission she she loves saying her story yeah. I should have actually got her here but she's actually going through some stuff with her son a teenage son mm -hmm. so, um, but you tell a summer story yeah well just she was the one I was telling you about you know she had she had her two kids taken away, she was, um, she was in the depths, like, her, her partner was murdered in New West, actually, that one that happened down on the tracks, and, yeah, years ago, well, about three years ago, I guess. Anyway, she came to e Fry and was um, staying in our, um, in our transit, not transitional housing, but our third, um, our, what did I call it? Second stage housing, the second stage housing. So she got through the addiction program and then went into the second stage housing and then she started at Walmart's four days ago. And she just worked her way up and she's keen and she wants to learn and she wants to share her knowledge with everyone. And, um, and when we go, we go to a big show over in, um, on the island, and she's indigenous. She just, she, oh yeah, she sits ground. We made her three days. Because she was just wanted to, to, to tell it, the, to tell her story, and that's what's so impactful, and that's what's great about your speaker series, is having those stories that, you know, with the clients, with, with our clients that are enmeshed now, it, it, it can be traumatizing. And, and we do have a few that would get up and speak, but it's not like, you know, we don't feel that it's a, you know, a show pony thing. You know, it's something that, that, that we can do for our women because they, um, if they give us the permission, because it's all about confidentiality and respect. Yeah. I mean, even unfortunately, more really severe racial prejudice that you talk about, like, you must run into people that just don't think these women should be around their kids. If yeah. they ignore the incarceration part and yeah. raising a baby in jail, there, you, there must, you must get problems oh, where they're just like, why is this program necessary? Why? Yeah, all the time, all the time. But that's why it's so important that we get out and we talk about it, you know? And, and we say these are the reasons why. Because, the you know, developmentally, those children have to be with their mothers to to form those those bonds, to, to teach empathy, right? To teach and learn empathy, it's a it's a teaching, you know. It really is a teaching thing, and um, and it, and and that is what I find is so important when I'm one to one with a mom and baby in in prison, you know. And they they don't have a room, but like we we do it in the salon, right? We have our meeting in the salon because there's no room for me to go into because they're, you know, they, they've got the summer room and they've got the gym, but we want to be private. And we make it work, but it would be really nice if there was a nice couch and some toys for the child to play with. Well, you know, but one day we just have to work at it, you know, because Elizabeth Fry, like CAFES, which is a Canadian association of Elizabeth Fry's actually changed the way that federal prisons were made from being cells like you see in, you know, prisoners on Walk H and Orange is the New Black, right? To, they live in houses. These women live, they, they're ready to a house, they cook their own meals, they, they have a canteen where they purchase their, their, their um, 
what they want to eat, and they and they get it. You know, they have an allowance, so they it it it's it's humane. You know, it's it's treating. Um, we all should be treated. And yes, they they they've done. You know, they have done a crime to to be incarcerated, and we're not saying that they shouldn't. You know, that the, they're their dues, but we're saying, like, for short sentences in in the um, provincial prisons, you know, often women are, are, are jailed for stealing food for their kids. You know, they can't feed their children. And so they get caught stealing, and then they go inside for three months. And the ripple effects of them going inside, the child will then be taken into care if there's not a family member available to look after that child. And then the, trying to get their, their kids back after that short little break of, oh, you're bad, so, you know, sorry. <laughs> um, you know, the, that, it, there's other ways that they can serve, you know? And, and it, 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 that's what we have to look at. That's what we have to change because we have to see the big picture on what those those jail times are doing to our societies because those those are where everything goes pear shaped and the and the kids are are so effective because you know sorry hi and how do you balance that I know the well being yeah, of the child because of course all has a ripple effect, but there's also the part of the cha chaotic upbringing, which I think is your your program completely. Yeah, how do you do balance? I, exactly. I mean that it, it is a big question. So I'll tell you my views, right? What what I see, what what because of what I do and the program I facilitate. I think that the way we have to tackle the problems, our societal problems, such as um, chaotic upbringings, you know, they, they are, they, there's, there's issues, but they, they've gone, they have gone on for generations, right? But the only way that that's going to change is by teaching, right, and learning not taking away. You know, there's more kids in care now that, 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 that were in, put in the residential school systems. You know? and, and, that, and what what I see is that we have to we have to work in the homes with people, right? Show people the way the you know how to how to get up in the morning and provide a, a healthy breakfast for your child. It's, it, it's not, you know, it, it's not hard to do, but it's hard to do if you've never had it, you know what I mean? So I, that's my take on it, is if I could go into a family and work with them for three months, I, I would say a three month stint, right, working closely with families, not necessarily living with them, but living with them, living near them, being a part of their family, and 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 showing them, you know. But it's it's so vast, but that that sort of you know divide that you're talking about, you know, the the child growing up in that chaos. But we know that the being with his mother, even if it is chaotic, is better. Than being in foster, than growing up in foster care. Obviously, the child has to be safe and has to be fed and has to be, you know. But the the some of the stories I hear are horrendous. Why the children are taken away, you know? And um, I I worked with one mom. Uh, she just got her kids back. She's got four children. And um, she just got her kids back after two and a half years of her children being away. And she was showing, she was, she was getting, 
she was paying for uh, renting a house that had four bedrooms in the house because she was showing them that she could house the four children, but she was paying for them. You know, she was working as a flagger and, and, and renting these huge houses that were empty. Her and her mom were living in them because she wanted to get her kids back and they were saying, you have to be able to afford a house. So she'd rent a house with that many bedrooms in it, which is not sustainable to her. You know? And anyway, she's got her kids back now, but she lives up in like Calcutt's Lake. There's no transit, it's just a nightmare. So we're just finding her housing in Surrey now. So it's, it's immersive. Like my job sucks me dry. Like I really am, like I can't tell you. Sometimes it's so frustrating because I care too much, you know? And it's hard, it is hard because I can see the ones that are truly want to be a family again and, and need that, you know? But it's, yeah, it's so, it, it's, it's really difficult sometimes. To, to find out how it's going to be out of stern. I knew I'd cry sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why I ask the question is because it's very difficult. Like, we have a, like, we live in a neighborhood when we're seeing a neighbor with situations where we're constantly wondering, like, what is the same thing? Are we making things work for that family calling mm -hmm. the authority? What what is it safe for the child? Like I'm so it's constantly because you know, people don't want to see a child. Yeah. They don't want that for mm -hmm. sure. But they might not have the skills or the support or even know that they need it. Exactly. But so that's the thing, they hit the nail on the head, they don't know that they need it, right? And that's where with with what the what Ephra does, we, we go through quite an extensive, um, when women come to our programs, we go, we delve deep into their, um, their, their paths and, you know, their, their, we, we have a, a, a screening process that we find out all those things and that's when we can offer the support that they truly need, right, whether it be you know, housing, or they're in poverty, so they need to, you know, they, they, again, what came first, chicken and egg, right? How do you get out of poverty if you can't find childcare for your child so you can go to work? Do you know what I mean? It's just endless. So it's about um, breaking everything down into achievable parts that we, as the staff, can support that you know and, and um, sometimes to the de detriment of yourself because you can care too much you know but it's uh, yeah. I got married this year I got married a couple of months ago and uh, Sean said to me when I first got engaged to this man she said don't let him go hold on to him because this life, like my my whole life before I was had him, you know, was was my work, right? It still is, but I'm learning ten years on the work life balance, you know, because you really have to, you know, put your own mask on before you help the person next to you, you know. And and I was you can't burn out. Because you're, you know, you're trying to to fix the world, and and it's not always fixable. But you can empower and elicit change in people by giving them the support that they need, and that's what you proud of. And I'm proud to say that I'm proud of this organization. Okay, so you're here. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Kirsty. Like, I'm 
Um, I think I left the board eight years ago. I was just calculating that. And I can't believe how much Elizabeth Bryan has grown in that time. Um, and it was big then. Like there was ventures over all over the place. And as a board, we were like astounded at what Sean and, and the team were doing. Um, and I can't believe when you keep talking about all the different houses, how much I don't like, yeah. There's <laughs> so many now that it, it is, it's hard. And it is incredible because, you know, not for profit, that, that's not sort of in most wheelhouses. That's right. You know, yeah. Because you, you have to build the infrastructure to be able to support what you want to do. And that's what Sean said. But it's the whole staff at a Fry, like all of them care more than, you know, most people, they, they time and effort. The number of emails we would get from Sean at four o'clock in the morning, I was like, does this woman ever sleep? Like, it becomes such a big part of your life. But also, it's that passion, it's that caring about people that very few people care about. And and that's something that you know, we Does want to share with us. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Sorry, it took me a while to get, I get really like.